Hey everyone. <clears throat> so I'm going to apologize right up front in case I get a coughing fit in the middle of this. I'm at the tail end of a cold and I've started this video twice. This is my third try. So this time if I cough, I'm going to keep going and you're just going to have to watch. Sorry about that, but here we go. I once uh, heard a woman tell her story. I think it might have been at church at a women's event. This woman had been born in India into a Roman Catholic family and but had married a Hindu man and he had it, made her renounce her Roman Catholic religion and convert to Hinduism. In India, of course, the man is the absolute authority in the home. The wife has no rights of any kind, and so uh, she had to do this. <clears throat> His power as her husband was absolute. Fairly early in the marriage, however, through a series of events, the woman came to a personal faith in Jesus Christ, one that moved her from a formal religion and a formal idea of God um, in a religious sense to personal life-changing faith. Uh, but she kept that secret from her husband, and she had a Bible that she kept hidden. Her husband learned of her faith eventually, and he said that he would kill her if she ever mentioned anything to do with her new belief in Jesus to any child that they ever had. But she, um, she chose to disobey him. And beginning when her oldest child was about four years old, she began secretly reading the Bible to her children every day at home. She was disobeying the authority in her home. Her story was one of violence. Beatings and emotional abuse were as common as mealtime in her life. But she persevered. She knew that the law was on her husband's side and if she left the marriage, she would leave her children behind and never see them again, have no rights to them at all. And so for the sake of continuing to share the gospel with her children, she stayed, enduring the abuse in order to teach them about Jesus. Eventually, however, it got to the point where her husband was actively trying to kill her and she was forced to flee India. By then, her children were adults and they them, and were themselves also living in Canada, and so she has come here to live. She lived under the authority of her husband, obeying as much as she could for as long as she could, except where obedience to him meant disobedience to God, and then she chose to obey God. Now, in Romans chapter 12, we read Paul's instructions to live sacrificially, to love sincerely, and to bless those who persecute us. And these instructions apply mostly to our behavior toward individuals. But what do we do when the authority that rules over us is not godly? Maybe it's even violent and evil. What then? What is our obligation as believers towards authority? And Paul addresses that in the next section. So we're starting in Romans chapter 13, and I'm going to read the first two verses to start with. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Those verses don't leave us a lot of wiggle room, do they? Everyone is to submit themselves to governing authority authorities. Everyone. That means you and me. And it says that there is no authority except that which is established by God. Now you might think, well, God, well, Paul did not know what the stats would be like at this point of the 21st century. After all, research says that 75% of the world lives under severe religious restriction. Christians in more than 60 countries around the world today are being persecuted for their faith in Jesus. Rape and beatings and imprisonment and murder are the experience of believers in our world today in many places. Paul could not possibly have meant that those horrible persecuting governments are put in place by God, could he? It's important to know what was going on when Paul wrote this. The Caesar that is on the throne at the time that Paul wrote Romans was Nero, one of the most violent and terrifying rulers of the Roman Empire from the perspective of the church. His cruelty and persecution of believers is well known. Just to give you one little example, he would, 
have believers covered in tar and light them on fire and have their burning bodies be used as torches to light his garden parties. Is that government is set in place by God? Really? Well, that's what Paul says. He is speaking from the point of view of someone living under persecution, and he is speaking to a church suffering persecution. The church can thrive in a democracy or in a constitutional monarchy, but it can also thrive under a dictator and under tyranny. God has used all such governments at various times to fulfill his purposes in the development of the church. God established government way back after the flood. Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 to 6. God said there, And from each man I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. God was giving authority to human beings to, <clears throat> to judge criminal matters and enact justice. All governments uphold a law that keeps evil in check. Yes, there are ways in which governments promote evil, but all governments have similar laws in basic ways. They punish those who take the life of someone else and they punish those who steal other people's things. Without such governments, crime rises, evil runs rampant, rampant and anarchy reigns. And so in that regard, a bad government from a spiritual perspective is better than no government. So God has instituted human government and human authority, and we are to consider the government that is over us to be set in place by God. He has established it, and not just governing authority, uh, but he's also speaking of all authority, family authority, um, police, church authority, teachers, all forms of it. God is the supreme authority in the universe. He is the ultimate king who reigns with total power and complete control. The human governments that exist simply do so under his authority. Now, that doesn't mean he approves of everything they do or even most of what they do. God does not approve of injustice or corruption. He does not, he hates persecution and cruelty and slavery and tyranny. But nothing is outside his authority and power. Every authority, even the very worst, will be used by God to achieve his purposes. And that is the testimony of the woman whose story I told you just a moment ago. The doctrine of the complete authority and control of God over all the universe is called his sovereignty. Now, a sovereign is a ruler, a ruler with complete control and authority, one who makes and upholds the laws. The monarch, uh, the Queen of England, is called the sovereign, but she actually doesn't reign with sovereignty. She doesn't have authority. She doesn't make laws. She doesn't uphold them. She is a figurehead only. A person with real sovereignty has total authority and total control. <clears throat> God's control is over the whole universe. <clears throat> so even when the government under which we live is terrible, even when the authority in our home or the boss we have at work is terrible, we take comfort in knowing that God has not lost control. He's still reigning. The idea of being under authority is that of standing in rank under a superior commander, the way an army stands in rank under its um, officer, its commanding officer. We are under the authority of the government as our commanding officer, knowing that the commanding officer over the government is God himself. And this image also applies to family authority and police, etc. Now, verse 2 tells us that the one who rebels against the authorities is actually rebelling against God. And those who do this stand under the possibility of punishment. And those are strong words. We can certainly think of small laws or local bylaws that we don't really want to obey. I mean, for example, if you live here in Langley, it's kind of galling to get a burn permit and burn your deadfall in your yard trash in, during burning month. And you burn it on the last day of burning month. And at the end of the day, you put out the fire. But the next morning, it's still smoking a little bit. And you get a $200 fine because it's smoking. Your, bar, your yard fire, although out, is smoking after the end of burning month. Now, that kind of thing is irritating. Those sorts of laws just gall us no end. 
There, there are laws we disagree with on the books of our government. There are some we agree with in principle, but regularly break. I'm speaking of those pesky little speed limit laws that we break probably on a daily basis. But all of these governing authorities, all human authority is set in place by God. And we are to obey these authorities as if obeying God himself. Obedience to God includes obedience to human authority. <clears throat> now, human gover government is not limited to our elected officials in Ottawa or the local tribal chief or dictator or king under which a person might live. It includes the local police officers and the local officials and the bylaws. It includes the authority of parents and of your boss at work and the elders in your church. In many cultures, it includes the authority of a husband in ways that are different from what we have here in North America. Authority comes in different ways and on many different levels. <coughs> but all of it is under the authority of God. How does your response to human authority testify to your submission to the authority of God, to your recognition of Jesus as King of all Kings? The world watches us to see if we live our faith. Many non-Christians believe in the rule of law. They would expect a moral person, a Christian to be a law abiding citizen. They would hold us to a higher standard when it comes to keeping the law than they might hold someone who is not a Christian or might, they might even not hold themselves to as high a standard as they would hold us because even though they might think of themselves as a moral person. So how you respond to the law and to human authority is part of the testimony of your life regarding your faith. What does your keeping of the law show of your submission to God? What about our government or the governments in other parts of the world frightens you? Do you feel as if the world is spinning out of control or as if your safety is at risk? Take your eyes off the news and look again at who is sitting on the throne of heaven. The lamb is there, Jesus, and he reigns with total control and with true justice. What promises of God do you need to remind yourself of in order not to be so anxious about the state of the world? Will you hold the truths of God in higher value than the news of world events? <clears throat> now, this is a difficult section. No matter when this is taught, there are going to be, there's going to be something going on with our rulers that we don't like. We have strong opinions about these things. And so it's tempting to ignore these verses or to skip over this section as being just too sensitive. But God doesn't give us that option. We have to face what God says and then look and see how we're living it. Okay, let's move into the next section. I'm gonna read verses three to five. <clears throat> for rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong, do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will, be, you will not be condemned. Or sorry, do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. Those who do right do not need to be afraid of the authorities. Now, I'm sure you can think of some situations in which a believer is doing right and has to fear the government. And perhaps because the government, that is because the government outlaws say belief in Jesus. But Paul is speaking here of some truths that we kind of need to see. First, most laws on the book of a country are based on the moral standards that are common to all people. You shall not kill. You shall not steal. You shall not lie in a court of law against another person. These are laws that are common to all people, for they are written on the human conscience. And the source of these laws is God himself. He is the ultimate standard of right and of wrong. And so when a government upholds those laws, they are doing right. And those who do these things rightly have nothing to fear from the government. In addition, we are told that these authorities are God's servants. Now we know they're not doing what God wants in many ways, 
But this idea of being servants of God is used to remind us that they are being used by God for his purposes. They are tools in his tool belt, so to speak. But also, God is establishing that he is the one to whom these authorities ultimately are going to have to give an account. They're going to have to answer to him. He is going to deal with any way in which they are not just or do not do right. Since they are his servants, he therefore is the master and they are answerable to him for what they do. These authorities do not bear the sword for nothing. They have real tangible power. Now, I'm sure you've heard stories of people who live in, in our country. In the US, they're called sovereign citizens. They have a different name in Canada, but they're people who say that they don't recognize the authority of the government. But that authority is still very real. And if a person who calls themselves a sovereign citizen is arrested, they will find that their lack of recognition of the government is really completely immaterial once the handcuffs are on and they're behind those prison bars. The government bears a sword and it has tangible power. <clears throat> There's one question that's not addressed in this passage that might come to mind here. What do we do when the laws of the government or other authority is directly opposed to the ways and the commands of God, to his nature. Well, the ultimate authority is God. So our obedience is to be first and foremost to him. And there are several scriptural examples of this for us. There, is, there are two such events recorded in the book of Daniel. In chapter three, the law of the king of Babylon was that everyone must bow and worship a statue of himself that the king had put up. This broke the law of God in that it, God's law stated that no image of anything should be worshiped and that nothing was to be worshiped other than God himself. <clears throat> Daniel and his friends broke the law of the king and kept the law of God. And the king then had them thrown into a furnace of fire as punishment, but God rescued them from that. The second example in Daniel is in chapter six. And this time, the king wrote a law that no one could pray to any God or any person other than the king himself. And anyone who did would be thrown into a den of lions. Daniel refused to obey this law and continued to pray openly to God. And he suffered the punishment under the law and was tossed into a den of lions. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John were pulled in before the government leaders and commanded not to teach any more about Jesus. And Peter and John replied in Acts 4, 19 to 20, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's eyes to obey you rather than God, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. This is a principle we too ought to live by. It is better to obey God than man. But the reality of our lives, especially here in North America, is that for the most part, we don't have to choose. We can obey the commands of God and still keep the laws of the land. Therefore, that is what God commands us to do. <clears throat> there are opportunities for us as citizens in Canada to have an impact on our government and the way they rule. We can vote for godly and moral people to be in government positions. We have the right to march or protest regarding things our government does with which we disagree. Like the civil rights movements in the South of the US, believers can achieve major change in the laws of our country and yet not break the laws themselves in the process. Believers have the right, as does any citizen, to influence the authorities to better more godly laws. But we are to obey the authorities for they are God's servants set in place for our good. The only exception is when to obey these authorities is to disobey God. Human authorities are God's servants to uphold right and punish wrong. Governments, even ungodly ones, have benefits for us. They uphold the law. We are to honor those authorities and obey the law for the sake of our conscience. In spite of the freedom to impact our culture or laws, social reform should not be our primary objective as believers. Now, don't get mad at me. I'm not saying don't get involved in social reform, but social reform only goes so far. It ought to be our goal to influence our culture most effectively by reaching people with the gospel of Jesus one life at a time. 
And so for the sake of our testimony, for the sake of conscience, for the sake of our submission to the authority of God, we obey the laws. In which areas are you focusing on rules or laws that you want to see changed and you do not, that do not really have any bearing on the sharing of the gospel? Will you ask God to empower you to obey human authorities so your testimony for Jesus is not hindered? Will you pray that God will give you a heart for people so that petty annoyances with laws you do not like or politicians you dislike will not matter? You will seek the salvation of others as your first priority. And perhaps we also ask to thank God for the freedoms we have here. Many believers who read these verses are faced with daily decisions regarding obedience to God versus obedience to human laws, and they risk much to obey God. God saved Daniel from death when Daniel chose to obey God over man, but God does not always do that. And many believers today die when they choose to obey God first. We are not in that position. We are free to own Bibles and to go to church, free to talk about Jesus to others and to worship God. And as annoying as our government might be at times, we have a lot to be grateful for in the freedoms that it, they provide us. The most significant we, freedom we have is that of sharing the gospel. How can you <clears throat> express gratitude to God for what the authorities provide for us in protecting that freedom? How does the reality of what other believers live under give you a greater satisfaction with what we have here? And how are you making use of that freedom to share the gospel with other people? Isn't it sad that we have the freedom to do it and we don't do it? We've been given a lot of freedom here. We ought not to waste it. Now I'm going to read verses 6 and 7 back again in chapter 13. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. <clears throat> now there is more due to the authorities that are over us than simply obedience. We are also called to do some things that are maybe more difficult. The first of these is pay taxes. Taxes are painful and we really don't enjoy paying them. <clears throat> we usually think they're too high and we often disagree with how our government spends the tax money they collect from us, but those taxes pay for things that we enjoy and use. Schools, healthcare, garbage collection, firefighters, armies and navies and libraries and museums and police and roads. We use these things. We need them. Try living without garbage collection for two months and you're going to really value the fact that we have garbage collection. Taxes also pay the wages of those who spend their time and use their talents to govern us, to provide us a safe place in which to live. And so we are to pay our taxes fairly and honestly. We also owe revenue. Now, this might refer to <clears throat> duties charged for goods brought into the country for us to use, and we have to pay that. It's owing, and we are to pay what is owed. And now for what is probably the hardest part. If respect is due, then respect. If honor, then honor. The authorities are people. Sometimes they are not doing what they should. Sometimes we think they're totally crazy, completely stupid. And we get pretty outspoken about how stupid and crazy we think they are. But they are due respect and honor. Now you might wonder how we can show respect or honor to some of the leaders we have. And I'm going to suggest two things. <clears throat> First, we owe respect for the office the person holds. The person in that office may not have an exemplary personal life. They may make foolish decisions or embarrassing statements. We may wonder how we were so foolish as to ever elect that individual and how fast we can get them out of office. But the office itself is deserving of respect. And so, therefore, is the person holding it. In addition, the person is created in the image of God and is an eternal soul for whom Jesus died. And that gives them value and dignity. There are things we say about politicians, names we call them, that we would never use when speaking to someone in church or a person that we interact with in business. 
But for some reason, we feel free to be disrespectful to politicians when they are in authority. And often the attacks become really personal, demeaning them almost as being less than a person in our eyes. And God calls us to a different way. <clears throat> Not that we have to agree with what they do. That is unrealistic. But we can disagree without being character assassins or without demeaning them or without disrespecting the office they hold. We are called to be respectful and peaceable, to be gentle in our dealings with others. We are commanded not to slander other people, not to be contentious. And I have to say, this is harder than paying taxes. Jesus was once asked if it was lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not. And it was a question that was designed to trap him. No matter what he said, someone was going to be angry. If he said that it was <clears throat> lawful and you should pay taxes to Caesar, the people were going to be angry at him and he would lose his popularity. If he said that, no, you should not pay taxes to Caesar, then Rome could be angry at him and it would be possibly considered subverting the authority of Rome. But Jesus responded by asking for a coin and then asking whose inscription was on the coin. And the answer was, of course, Caesar's. And then Jesus responded by saying, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. Matthew 22, 15 to 22. See, there are things that indisputably belong to the government of our country, and there are things that indisputably belong to God, and we are to pay both. Believers are to give to human authorities what is due to them. James Madison was the fourth president of the United States, and he said, We have staked the whole future of American civilization not upon the power of government, far from it. We have staked the future of all of our political institutions upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. Nice ideals but completely unattainable. We cannot stake our society on the power of each person to obey the Ten Commandments, for no one can do it, and many people, due to their love of their own sin, do not want to, to do it. So government is a necessity. God instructs us as how to respond to authorities, how to live under them. We are to show respect and honor. How do your tweets or your Facebook posts reveal you to be doing with that? How much time do you spend praying for our leaders? If we spent more time praying for them and less time criticizing them, what do you think might result? Maybe we should try and find out. By example, we are training our children. How are you modeling respect and honor for the leaders and authority over us? Not because we think they are great, but because God commands it because we are obeying him, our true and highest king. Right now, no matter how much we may be dissatisfied with our government on occasion, we are living under one of the best governments on earth, comparatively speaking. There are brothers and sisters of ours living in much worse conditions, and those commands fall on them just as much as on us. <clears throat> Someday we may find ourselves living under a dictatorship, or under a government that has made our faith in Jesus illegal. We may be persecuted and thrown in jail or even killed for our faith. The expectations for us will be unchanged. We are to obey whenever possible and honor and respect those in authority over us, for they are put in place by God for his purposes. And his purposes are good and they never fail. First Timothy 1.17 now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. That's the king we serve.